yeah, uh, I care a lot about the quality of life for uh, people working in engineering. And so uh, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to make that quality of life uh, good, I guess. And so uh, I was really hoping that Cody would get up here and say that I was a really terrible boss and I made a whole bunch of mistakes. Um, because I really want to actually find that kind of feedback about myself. Uh, and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, so I'm going to stick this one down because I think you all can hear me from the lab. Um, so yeah, so who I am, uh, there's my excellent mustache. Um, so I'm the director of IT operations at Zipcar. Um, I, my career path is mostly sysadmin-y, but lots of sort of DevOpsy practices. Um, and over the last few years, I've had escalating amounts of um, responsibility for people, which means that I've transitioned um, in a career path that uh, is growing from uh, technical into leadership roles. Um, so there's uh, a couple different pieces that I want to hit uh, on about what that means for an organization um, and how you use that kind of career and that kind of model in order to build a healthy organization that people will want to work for. Um, so there's uh, a few chunks of that, that. Some of this is about leadership. Um, some of this is just about happy people. Uh, it's about having a healthy career and it's options that you can have for structuring an organization. Um, I've rewritten this uh, talk like three or four times uh, over the last two days in or because I've gotten uh, a lot of interesting ideas from people who've talked before, um, and I'm hitting on a lot of the same themes, so hopefully this will uh, help to synthesize some of that information. Um, so I'm gonna sort of start, we have this old model where you had engineers, and then they hit a wall and they say, well now I gotta be a manager, and you stop being an engineer, and this is the career progression that you're expected to take. Um, and the problem with this is that it really is, uh, it's not a recipe for success unless you're really, really lucky. Um, and there's gonna, I've got some better models that I'll explain later, but um, what it really is about how do we turn that into a, uh, a team environment where everyone is actually um, able to contribute and is able to, to be successful um, and where everyone is taking care of each other. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is sort of what it means to be a great leader. Um, and so the, the example I want to give Neo you know, here is, is think about, you know, you've had good bosses, you've probably had some terrible bosses, um, and maybe you've been lucky enough to have a great boss or two. But you can think back and, and recognize what is different about them, what made the good ones good and what made the terrible ones terrible. Um, and so what, there's, there's a lot of uh, pieces to that, and so in my experience it's that the, the great leaders and the great managers are the ones who were, uh, who understood what you did, who were available and who were useful. And what that meant was if you're bouncing ideas off of someone, they could give you useful feedback, but they also could provide you with useful context so that if you were going off in the wrong direction, they'd be able to say, actually, this is probably why that won't work, whether that's a technical thing or an organizational thing or, uh, a political thing or whatever constraints that the organization has. Um, and then they, they also help to bring that context for what your organization is doing down to um, what you're trying to do. Um, so uh, one of the things that I found really um, important in terms of how to be able to be that person, uh, I had a revelation probably a year to two years ago that I, I realized that I would not want to work for me and that I was building an organization where I would not want to work and I would have already quit. And that made me look around and do a lot of soul searching and try and figure out what am I screwing up and how did I get to this place where I'm not going to find someone who can be as successful as I've been. Like, I'm blocking the road behind me, and I needed to fix that. And so that really meant that I needed to figure out how to be vulnerable. And I needed to figure out how to show that vulnerability to people within my organization and, and people elsewhere. It meant that I needed to step up there and say, you know what? I have to stop trying to prove myself. I have to stop trying to to hold on to all this. I have to be willing to let go. I have to be willing to take risks, and I have to be willing to let things fail. 
And that's really, really scary as an ops person because if you fail, oh my god, the business is going to be ruined. Um, but it turns out there are lots of ways, uh, both technically and organizationally, to make that safer. Um, but it really means you have to be vulnerable and you have to be willing to be vulnerable and take those risks and be brave. Um, so why does vulnerability matter? Um, so vulnerability is the way that you build trust. Um, if, if I stand up here and say, guess what, I made a whole bunch of mistakes, you're going to start to trust me a little bit more because it means that you're not looking for, okay, well, what's the thing that he's hiding? There's, you're not looking for, you know, what's wrong, what's missing, and trying to, to fight. You want to be open and honest about your mistakes. Um, and you want to be willing to ask for help. And that goes two ways. If I don't trust someone, then they're not going to come and ask me for help unless they really, really have to. And I want someone to be able to ask me for help long before they have to. Um, and it's not just you know, trust from a leader uh, down to uh, people working for you. It's trust within the team. Um, it ties right back to some of the, the on-call stuff where, uh, that Liz was talking about, whereas if the team is willing to ask for help from each other and to show vulnerability of, I don't know how to do this thing, can you help me? That means the whole team is going to be happier. Um, so how do you get there? You listen to people. And like, this seems sort of really profound. We talk a lot about how DevOps is about communication and collaboration and how do we do that. But it's not just talking to people, it's listening. If you don't listen to people, they won't communicate. You need to be able to demonstrate that it's worthwhile for people to communicate with you or with your team or with your organization. Um, and that you actually get something out of, uh, out of that. So when I go out to, and talk to whether the person's in Q, QA or whether um, you know, they're an engineer in a different team or whether they're in finance or a different business unit, if I'm not able to be a useful resource for them to talk to, they're not going to talk to me and I'm going to lose that context and that ability to make the right decisions. Um, and likewise, that means that I need to be able to have that trust with people outside of my organization as well to be able to go and talk to them. Um, so as, as you're talking to your team and as you're talking um, within your team, listening is the first part. Um, and again, it's, it's be a useful person to talk to. Provide useful feedback. Um, at the moment that you become a painful person to talk to, whether it's because you're saying no all the time or whether you're overwhelmed or you're not pro providing enough attention, people are not going to want to talk to you. You've become a pain point instead of a useful addition to the environment, and you're going to break down those communication structures that we all value so much. Um, so in addition to listening to, to your team and, and building that out, yeah, listen outside your team. All right, I did that one. Um, it also means listen to your peers, um, listen to your boss's peers, figure out who your team's customers and providers are, both internally and externally. Go and talk to the people that interact with either the technology your team is working on or the people that are interacting with your team directly and listen to what their experiences are. Um, then you take those experiences and you have to go back and talk about them. Synthesize that information that you've gathered and bring it back to your team. Talk about what you found out from this other thing, whether that's, oh, here's the context of the new strategic business plan, and we're going to make 17,000 different kinds of widgets. But really, that's not as scary, because here's why we think that's a good idea. Um, and it means that you need to be able to explain all of that information in a way that is coherent and makes sense and is relatable to the people who to where people are working. Um, it comes down to storytelling. Um, so it's telling the story of what your team does and how that fits into the overall organization. Um, you, you need to be able to say, OK, well, you know, the ops team are there because, uh, so I work for Zipcar. I have a really, the great story that I use is, if our stuff is down, that means there is a member out in the wild who's trying to get into a car, and it's in the rain, and they're soaking wet, and they can't get into the car because our stuff isn't down, is down, and this is going to really impact their day. And that's a really powerful story about what it means when the thing that we are working on isn't working. Um, so maybe I'm lucky because I have a great story. But every organization has those kinds of stories about why the thing that you are doing is important. And if you can't find that story, 
maybe your organization needs to do some deeper introspection about why you're doing what you're doing. Um, so yeah, so how does your team help the organization achieve its goals? Um, if it's you know, operations work, it means you're delivering uptime. If it's feature engineering, it means you're delivering new ways for the business to accomplish uh, the goals of that organization. And the, the last part that I'm still struggling with, and I don't have a good way of answering that, is how do, how do we, within the engineering culture, help shape those business goals? Um, so that's about explaining what the possibilities are to people so that we can start modeling and maybe making choices about where we want to go as a business, as an organization. Um, it's about making those possibilities available um, and sort of opening up the eyes of people of what, what can happen, what can we do. Okay, so that's sort of um, what I view the role of, of a leader in an organization is. Um, and the next piece of this about how do you make engineers happy um, is about creating a culture of learning and teaching and creating an environment where people can exchange knowledge and information. To go back to what Jill was saying, you know, people want to have a learning environment. They want to be picking up new things. Every time that I have left a job, it's because I realized I've stopped learning. And to me, that was the most important signal that I was done at an organization, is if I was no longer learning something, I needed to go somewhere else. Um, so now I've been doing a lot of learning of how to be a manager and how to design an organization, but I'm also learning how to teach and how to uh, teach people how to teach. Uh, so one of the things that's really, really interesting and really challenging, you know, we all, we all sit here and talk about how we all want, we're hiring, but we're all hiring senior engineers. Um, but your junior engineers are where you need to apply a lot of this energy, because if you can take care of your junior engineers, your senior engineers are going to have an opportunity to learn how to do more of these things. Um, so uh, I like to talk about like, why it's really awesome to have junior engineers. And uh, so junior engineers, they, have, they don't have as many bad habits that they've learned from other organizations. You can teach your own organization's bad habits to them. <laughs> and for that, I'm sorry, Cody. <laughs> Um, but they're just as smart as, those, as the people uh, who have 10, 15 years of experience. They just don't yet have that experience. Um, and that means that you need to figure out how do we get people that experience within our organization in as relevant a way as possible. Um, so this means that you have to do a lot of introspection and assess. You know, it's a ch it, you change the balance of is this a learning opportunity? You know, is this an opportunity for skill growth? Can we take an extra day or week or month to do this thing in order to have two people who haven't done it before have the experience and, and gain knowledge of how to do it? Or is this a thing where we want to, you know, pair up a senior and junior person and push them hard to get through it? And it's about judging that and assessing when it's time to push someone outside their comfort zone and when it's time to say, okay, wait, you're panicking. Let me pull, the, pull that back a little bit and to provide that support. So people are a little bit on edge, but not so, so much that they can't grow. Um, if you break people, they're not gonna grow. Don't burn people out. This seems really like trite for me to say that, so I don't know. Um, yeah, mistakes are scary, but everyone makes them, and mistakes are how you learn. Um, at, so what I try and do is try and figure out how I can give people enough risk and enough exposure and enough vulnerability that whatever they're working on, if they break it, they can fix it. But I also set that expectation that if you're working on something that you need to be able to fix it, and whether that, that means that you're gonna fix it yourself because you're super confident in a cowboy, or it means you're gonna go call the cowboy on the phone, um, but you've, told, you've set up that context so that you have the right people ready to help you. Um, and so as a leader, I need to be keeping an eye on, okay, do we have the right mix of people with the right context for doing this thing? How do we make those mistakes less scary? Um, but at the end of it, you have to be brave and you have to be willing to let people make mistakes. And that's really, really hard. But it's the way that an organization can grow. It's very different from the role that you know, anyone has played as an engineer before where, oh, mistakes are bad, you know, it's important. You have to, you can see the mistakes coming and you have to use those as a teaching opportunity. Okay, so how do we actually like get there? Uh, 
So I've been thinking a lot about organizational engineering, uh, which I Googled last night, and it turns out that this is a really, like, this term is loaded and has some other connotations, so uh, I don't mean that thing. Um, so organizational engineering, the way that I think about it, is applying the principles of, of DevOps and continuous uh, improvement and feedback loops and uh, those types of things that we use for our engineering uh, to deliver our technology to figure out how do we design and engineer an organization that will deliver the technology that we want. Um, it's sort of, if you think about Conway's law, it's how do you build an organization so that the technology delivers the thing that you actually want. Um, so uh, I was talking about how you have engineered a manager. So one of the options that, I've seen, that we're seeing a lot more organizations uh, start to do is to figure out how to pull that management track back into engineering and how to create uh, an opportunity for engineers who want to grow in a way that is not managing people um, to give them an opportunity, um, you know, whether it's principal engineer or architect or uh, you know, sort of that technical authority, and to be able to distinguish that from being the person who is managing people. And that means you have to build some sort of parallel structures. Um, so if you look at a, a, a non-technical manager organization, you probably have you know, a manager up on top who doesn't really understand what's going on, but has a head for business or has a head for whatever other project management, something like that. And then you've got your individual contributors who are actually delivering the technology. Um, and maybe you've got a junior individual contributor because most teams have, have them. So if this is your mix-up mix up of a team, um, this gives you, you know, it's a unit, it sort of works. Um, so what, what I'm starting to see more of and what I'm encouraging is to uh, take a, an engineer and turn them into a leader. And what that means is that I take that management piece and I make that a, small, a smaller chunk of what the manager has to do. So here we're looking at like, you're still 75% of the time an individual contributor. Your hands are in the code. You're doing code reviews. You're, your fingers are on the keyboard on production. But about 25% of your time is spent doing the organizational work necessary to make the team healthy. And in order to do that, it means that we actually take someone else and delegate those pieces of the organizational work. Um, but make it part of that organization. So the person who is making a decision is a technical person who is engaged and connected to the technology rather than someone who is disconnected. It means I go, and whether that you know, assistant is um, a traditional administrative assistant or project management or you know, a scrum master, agile coach type role, or uh, whether they're someone who understands the financial modeling and how to put together spreadsheets and reports and, and pretty pictures. There's a lot of non-technical work that's expected of an organization that we default to giving to the manager because we think that they have responsibility and authority. But what we should be thinking about doing is how do we make that responsibility and authority uh, able to be invested in a technical person and delegate the pieces of supporting that technical person to make those kinds of choices. So then you can take this and you can actually scale it up. Um, and so. This means that you can spread around um, that uh, technical and non-technical role. So the way that I'd like to explain it, uh, I'm you know, very egotistically putting myself at the top here. I do one hands-on keyboard thing a week. If I'm doing less than that, it means I'm disengaged, I don't know what's going on, I can't make useful decisions, and I've gone off into a pointy-haired boss land. But if I am doing more than one technical thing a week, I'm not letting my team grow, I'm not giving them enough space, I'm uh, not making myself available enough to be a useful leader. And so I keep an eye on, on how that ebb and flow is happening, and I watch how the folks who are uh, leaders working within my organization are growing and what their work balance is. And then I figure out, okay, maybe there's a new chunk of non-technical work that we need to cut off and put somewhere. And figuring out how to, how to take that so that you've got things that are traditionally, okay, the project manager is the one making decisions. Well, no, let's make it so the project manager is the one who's keeping track and making sure all of the information is up to date, but the technical people are making the decisions about which things should happen. And it's about creating that transparency and that information flow. Whew, okay. Um, so how do we get there? Uh, it means that we need to create some other parallel structures that are implicit um, in that traditional organization design. And a lot of this is about coaching. Um, and that means that 
you figure out the kind of thing that a person needs to learn, um, and you go and either find that resource for yourself or you find that resource for people, and you seek help and you try and build that. Um, so if we take that, it looks like, um, if I take one of the, that example, so maybe I've got this person who really understands the finance processes really well because that's a thing that's really important to you know, that organizational unit, and they're gonna work to coach your technical person how to do it. Instead of the financial person being the one making the decision, they're helping the technical person understand the finances to make that decision. Um, and they're teaching them how to do it and they're coaching them on it. Uh, but you probably go out and find a mentor. And in reality, like, if, I'm, if I was drawing this picture for myself, I probably have seven or eight different people that I seek coaching kind of feedback from on a weekly basis. Um, and it means that you, but, but it doesn't have to follow that structure. It doesn't have to be an invert. You know, you can have people coaching peers. You can have people coaching, you know, up. It's really important to be able to create that culture where you have learning and mentorship as part of the way you do business. You make time for it. You set up one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings. You set up time that people can devote to each other and to care for each other. Um, and so there's a lot of different, I mean, I could go at length about this. So I'm gonna pause and ask for questions. Uh, so the question was, how does the ratio of technical uh, contributor to leadership time spent when you have a smaller team, say maybe two people. And I think that what you have to do is look at your team. So if you've got a team of two people, uh, there's someone that that team reports up to. And if you want to move that around, you figure out how, how do you take the pieces of uh, that, or, or maybe there's not, maybe it's just the two of you and you've got your customers, um, but someone's probably better at interacting with the, the finance side and someone's probably a little bit better at interacting with the technology side. Um, and it's about figuring out how you can blend those responsibilities together and then you look at the, the way in which, okay, maybe we've got two people and they're both really technical and no one really understands the finances. You go out and find someone who might not be like a CFO quality, like person who's gonna wanna come in and take total control of it. You find someone who is still learning how to do that um, and you provide a learning uh, experience for someone to, to figure that out. Or if, whatever the, the thing that is consuming the time of the person who is trying to be the leader, you figure out what that is um, and you figure out a way to shift that burden off of that person so they can be technical and they can make technical decisions. Okay, so the question was how do you approach that decision of uh, you know, continuing as an individual contributor or going into management and do I feel that I've made the appropriate decision myself? Uh, so. I would say that I've been lucky enough to be able to approach that decision by taking little pieces of uh, exposure to management over time. So one of the things that we can talk about, that coaching relationship is a great way for someone to start to pick up those people skills without having that responsibility. Um, and you can, I spent about a year effectively managing three teams before I realized, oh crap, I'm actually managing three teams instead of just one. Um, and so I kind of accidentally did it in a way that then I decided, you know what, this is kind of working, let me see how I can do this for real. Um, but I wanted to make sure that it's not a one-way street. I'm, I'm technical enough that I could change that decision. I, I could go and find someone else to take a different piece of that leadership role uh, and let me go back to being technical work. And to have the flexibility in the organization, I think I'm relatively lucky about that. But other people have to change jobs in order to sort of backtrack on that decision. And I think that's something that we're still struggling with as a corporate culture in, in America of how to distinguish that kind of role. Um, but yeah, I would say, I think on a weekly basis, I think like, am I doing, is this the right thing for me? Am I doing, am I doing this well? And I still like to think that I'm doing it well and that I'm not sure that I, would be able to uh, find someone who will do it better than me. So I'm gonna do it because I'm a little bit arrogant, I guess. Uh, but hopefully the people on my team and the people around me will tell me, you know what, you're screwing up. Um, does that hit what you're looking for? I guess another, another way I could uh, talk about that is to create opportunities for people to do um, project management or project leadership or to take 
um, a small piece of work that's gonna require some of those things that will eventually build up to management skills and say, you know what, for a month, you're gonna be project manager of this thing. And if it doesn't work well, you know, we can talk about it at the end of the month, you know, how did it go, what happened, you know, and learn and gain with less uh, commitment, less risk, and less long-term implication, you know, if it doesn't work. Fail fast. I think I'm, actually, I think I'm out of time. Uh, sorry. Um, so um, I'm, ha I'm happy to keep engaging in this conversation um, through in the halls or on Twitter. Um, and I have a slide of like resources and books that I'm totally not going to put up. Um, so thank you.